society's ills would be eradicated. I believe that this morning, don't you? Let's worship him for a few minutes here this morning. Let's praise his name. Lift him up here in this morning. Oh, God, we love you this morning. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and for your wisdom. We bless your name, Lord. We bless this congregation as we come, as the ushers come. Thank you for your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Thank you. 
place that can worship him ahead of the victory today. Hallelujah, even through your storm, he's already provided. Hallelujah, can we thank him for how he's making a way in this place, even when we don't see it, even when we don't know that he's working. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for that today.
you pour out your praise on them right now? Could you glorify them in this place? Lord, it's all about you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue to praise him. Lord, you're good, and your mercy endures forever. Lord, we glorify you in this place. Hallelujah. We want to feel your spirit move, God, because it's all about you, God. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord, we praise you.
Amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Shout for the victory. Shout if you've been set free. I'm going to tell you what, there's something to it when it says the redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. If I've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy and the enemy is all around and he's waiting to take me at any turn, I think I need to give a shout that he knows whose side I'm on. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to feel his presence here. Why don't we give the Lord another hand clap of praise and you can be seated. Amen. Woo. I'm so afraid I'll lose my voice, but I sure feel like singing that again. We'll let them, we'll let them have a have a route. Amen. One I, we would like for all of our fathers to stand. If you're a father in the building, please stand. This is your day, so we want you to stand. And we would ask that if you would begin to make your way up to the front. There's someone with a phone that's going to take a picture. Because phones are much better, right? No, that's just all we have. So, if you are a father, if you, oh, well, I was going to say something else, but I was going to say if somebody calls you daddy, you can come to the front, but this is not the time and the day we're living in, so, and if y'all can kind of move to the middle, if y'all would, act like you're going to love each other today anyway, let me step down. All right, preliminaries, you can remain standing there. We are not just going to give you a picture. That is not all you're going to get. And so, um, Brother Eric, let me get you and Brother Kenneth to do me a favor. And if you guys would... If you guys would split these up, and one start at one end and one comes from one at the other. Now, Sister Carrie and I went looking for stuff for Father's Day for de decorations and you know uh, the world doesn't think as much of Father's Day as it does Mother's Day and I know why that is that's because it's not as lucrative of an event but we do want to give all of our fathers a hand clap and appreciation for them today and you're going to find out how much a father really means this morning and just to set you mothers at ease, we're not going to act like they're more important than you, amen? But in their envelopes today, they all get a tidal wave, uh, a tidal wave, well, thank you, thank you, brother. We, we all get a tidal wave car washed, it's a, you get a $20 wash for that certificate, and I think that they're good for almost a year, so they're just right and fresh and new, so if you would take advantage of those. Also in there is a free ticket for the raffle that's going to take place here in a little bit for the smoker. So a free ticket. And I realize, and everybody says, well, that's not fair. Well, I realize that only one guy is walking away with it. So that's why they're all going to get the free ticket. <laughs> and so one of the guys is going to walk away with it, but the first use has to be here at a men's event. Or should we do it a ladies event for the first use, a second one of men's, because that way we can critique and get it all right for the with time. we Either way. We're, we're excited today that someone's going to win the smoker. And so, um, one more time, why don't we give them another hand clap of praise. They can be seated. And I see them all. Please make sure that you turn in your ticket, put your name on the back of it. If you don't want to participate, put somebody else's name on the back of it. But make sure that those get to Brother Daniel after service before we do the raffle. So... And if you, do they have, Brother Daniel, have they already brought the box in? If they would, you just get, there you go. He has the box, so please make sure you put your name on it. Well, I've checked all the tickets so far. They have names on them. That's how we'll identify you, because I know that dads, if they didn't give it to your wife, you don't have that ticket and don't know where it's at, because she's got your ticket. 
and it's somewhere in her purse, and you ain't never going to find it. That's why I don't go in my wife's purse. I don't go in. I don't, I don't know, need to go in there and find stuff she's had in there for three or four years. She don't even know what's in there. Amen. This morning, I do have something that's kind of heavy on my heart, and I'll go ahead and make the usual disclaimer. Mother's Day is harder for me to speak at, and I say that because I'm not a mother. I've never been a mother. I will never be a mother. I have no idea what it's like to be a mother. I don't even pretend to know what it's like to be a mother. I don't want you to hook me up to a TENS machine to make me know in some weird way how it is to be a mother because even that in itself is laughable. Amen. Amen. I see these guys on, on YouTube and videos getting hooked up to these machines and they're cringing and twisting and turning. That's a small price that they pay. Now, wear it around for nine months and we'll talk about pain. I don't get into that foray. And I, I hear men stand up and say, well, I'll tell you, women think men, preachers, men, well, I'll tell you how women are, and women are like, dude, you ain't one, shut it down. I'm not going to get up here and pretend to tell you about women today, but I, I, I am a father, I am a man, and I do know a little bit about that. And before I start, I want to tell you that I have on my lucky socks today, these socks right here, these were purchased last year, Sister Courtney got me a pair, Sister Chloe got me a pair. And they're so proud when they get you a gift. And they, you can tell it's from their heart. And children are like that. And they got me these socks. The other pair is blue and would match probably better. But I had something I'd like to say this morning about these socks. The socks that Sister Courtney, bu Sister Courtney bought me say on it, world's number one dad. And I looked at those socks and I thought, this is just great. And I opened Chloe's and I read it. And thought, this is great, it's special. I got my hugs, and we went about our day, and the first time I wore the blue ones, I just couldn't help but read again, World's Greatest Dad, and how that felt. And then I pulled out the tan ones the next time and was going to wear them. And I looked at it, and it doesn't say World's Greatest Dad. And that's what I thought it said. It says, and if you want to come take a look, you can. It says, World's Okayest Dad. Now, Sister Chloe didn't know that either. And so when I told her, I was like, okay, I see what the deal is. Courtney, in her heart, she was devastated. And so you see, it doesn't matter what the writing is on the sock. The heart came through, and the heart was what she wanted me to know from her heart that she thought that I was the world's greatest dad. So it doesn't matter what's been written on you by the world. It doesn't matter what's been written on you by society. And let me tell you this, fathers, it doesn't matter what the world will ever write on you as a dad. Do not be ashamed of the department that you hold. Stand up proud and be dad because God created you with a specific intent in mind. And we need men to be men. We need fathers to be fathers. And... The, the title of my message is already up on the, the board this morning, and, and it is Turning the Hearts of Our Children. Turning the Hearts of Our Children. And I, I'm going to read a few scriptures here so, for your hearing this morning, so I don't expect you to stand this morning. A little bit of a different atmosphere. But I want to read in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Somebody say amen. amen. He will turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. Amen. It's awesome for us to stand here today as fathers and think that our children's heart is turned towards us. Or that we are a good dad. Let's put it like that. That we're a good dad. But if we do not have the attention of our children and their hearts are not turned to us, then that could be a great detriment to the fatherhood that we hold. Luke 1, 16 and 17 says, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to their Lord God, the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The hearts of the father to the children. So in both places here, it talks about the turning of the hearts. And I think that we've said much about fatherhood and I don't know that we've said enough about fatherhood. We've said a lot about motherhood, and I don't know that we say enough about motherhood because there seems to be some disconnect in the heart of our world today when it comes to parenthood. I respect and admire and even applaud our mothers for the great lengths that God has called them to go through to birth a child. There's no amount of of pumping fathers up that can diminish the role that a mother plays. But it's not just a nine-month role that she plays. Amen? Their preparation for motherhood starts in the early teen and even preteen years of that little girl's life. And years well before her ever giving birth, takes place, there's something that begins to change within the physical body of that young lady and that lasts well beyond the childbearing years that takes place. And so it's hard to speak of any greater burden because this burden starts before she ever has a burden to have children. There are things that she will carry, things that she will bear as part of her physical makeup that she didn't ask for. Come on, you got to ask the question, why is he talking about mamas? Because I'm fixing to talk about daddies and it's not going to be any less. Any less, amen. They bear the physical burden, the actual little, literal burden of carrying that child. And I feel that it's okay to give mothers a shout out this morning for the job that they do, for the burden that they carry. You may be asking this morning, well, if we're going to make a little bit of a deal about Mothers, we can only expect that something's fixing to come about us as fathers. And I've already mentioned and feel like, honestly, that men bear, in the physical aspect, a very small, in the physical aspect, a very small part of the burden for the birthing of a child. There's no sharing of the womb. It's not your turn today, my turn tomorrow. That's done by mom. There's not the physical heartache and heartbreak that she went through as a, a teenager that learned or a preteen that learned that her, her physical makeup would forever be changed for the most of the duration of her life. She would struggle with certain aspects that, that she was not happy about. Amen? And that's one of the reasons why if, if a guy goes and talks about his problems, I just look at him strangely and tiptoe quietly off, Brother Rodney. we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about the physical aspect of carrying a child there's no capacity of our own to participate in that physical package the gift the bundle of joy but I sat at my desk I pulled my thinking down thinking hat down real low over my ears and I asked myself this question if such a physical emphasis is placed upon the shoulders of a young lady if there's such a physical aspect that's changed in the heart and the life and the mind and the body of a young lady, shouldn't there be an equal burden placed upon the shoulders of a young man? When is it time? When is th- this obligation going to take shape? When does it begin to take shape in the life of a young man? Because we can see, we can know, we understand that a physical thing has happened in her life, but what about his life? What's happened? What's taken place? What can we say that correlates even closely? Is there, is there a burden that men must carry that somehow equals that of a physical burden that she must carry? And I say, at risk of being misunderstood today, that there is an equal burden to bear. There is an eternal burden to bear. There's one that just doesn't last for just a moment in time. Amen? In Malachi chapter 4, we read that he would turn the heart of the father to the children. 
That means that somewhere in a man's life, and I want to say this this morning, I'm talking to the young men this morning, somewhere in your life, even right now, you should be having your heart influenced and say, this is where I'm going to stand as a man. Do you know that's why we have men of valor? Boys of valor, that's why we have that because they need to understand at 10 years old that there's a burden that I must carry. If she's got to carry one, then I must carry one. And it's, it is very, very vital and important. So don't wag your finger just yet. Don't do your nanas just yet. Young men, you should be thinking very hard and very seriously about how you're going to raise your kids. Amen? Because if we don't, we step onto an arena with, well, well, maybe we could try. No, we need to sit down now. We need to observe real men and how they carry themselves. And that's where I say when it talks about the children, the hearts of the children have got to be turned to the fathers. But that can't be accomplished just because I want it to. That can't be accomplished just because I feel like I am a, a great specimen of a man. Can't be accomplished because I have broad shoulders or the right hair or the right this or the right that. Amen? There has to be some shared. And this is what is brought out in Malachi chapter 4. It, it just reads something. There's something in it that really, really began to bother me when I read this. So, again, just like aforetime and before that time, and time before that, just a little, the turning of the heart began to pump into my brain, and I began to think about this. But there's not just a easy, happy-go-lucky, band-aid fix for this thing, because the scripture goes ahead and says, says in Malachi 4, that if the children's heart are not turned to the fathers, then I will come and I will smite the earth with a curse. So there's a curse that's put upon earth, because the children's hearts are not turned to their fathers. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Young people, this is not your burden to bear. Amen? It's not your responsibility to worry about turning your heart. This is an enticement that has to come from a man that lives for God. I was talking to somebody this past week. On Wednesday, I believe it was, and it was talking about, we were talking, and I couldn't find the, I didn't look for the reference. I have used it before. When it talks about Lot, and the, the story goes like this. Lot was a well-to-do man in, in Sodom. Lot was, Lot was a man of influence in Sodom. But Lot had more of a mind to stand in his place of honor at the gate than he would relaying these truths to his children and to their future husbands. He, he found more pleasure in being the prestige of being the smart guy, the, the businessman, and standing in a place of honor and recognition than he did of being a father, a man about the house. And so, because he did, the Bible talks about that his family, they basically looked at him and said, what? When he began to preach to them, he, this is the truth, this is going to happen. When he got down on his knees, Sister Mary, a living testimony before them and said, if you don't change your ways, you're going to go to hell. There's a hell coming. And they looked at him and said, do what? They laughed him off. Because he had not turned their hearts towards him. Well, I thought we were trying to turn people's hearts towards God. Let me tell you, people will never know God until they know you know God. They will never know God until they know that I know God. And I want to tell you, reading your Bible, saying that you say prayer, or even sitting down and saying prayer over your meal in a restaurant does not equate living for God. Amen? Just because we wear the badge Christian... And let me tell you, that word in and of itself has turned people away from God. It's time for the real Slim Shadies to stand up. Amen? And I, I don't, uh, I'm sorry if that kind of messes with your theology, but I heard that, that one time and it said, would the real Slim Shady please stand up? There's a, there's a genuine, there's a real, there's a bona fide. 
And if we don't be the real, the bona fide, the genuine, then all the world will see is the facade. And we're sick and we're tired of the facade. I said we are. Amen. So there's an obligation that should begin to form in the heart of a child. But the heart of that child should be to look to the father. Look to their father. And see an example worthy of following. There is a shared responsibility here. Because the heart of the father has to be turned to the children. And the heart of the children have to be turned to the father. It's an even flow, if you will, of a back and forth but there, that obligation falls upon the father to make sure that the heart of that child is turned towards him so that he correctly reflects the heart of God. Amen? In this world, be, be sure that you'll be misunderstood. Fathers, I want you to listen to me. In this world, be sure that people will mistake what you say for something other than what it is. But let me tell you, the greatest witness and the greatest testimony you have is when your children know what you believe. That your children can stand up and say what you believe. Look, I know what it's like to have siblings that don't come to church. I know what it's like to have siblings that don't serve God. But I want to tell you what you can go ask them. They'll tell you what it takes to be saved. They'll tell you what it takes to live right. And they'll tell you because I also have cousins and I have other people in my family that know what it takes. And I've had them stand up and say, because your daddy lived for God, that makes me want to live for God. And I'll tell you what, it's the duty of the father to turn the heart of the children. And it's a two-way street. In Luke 1, it bears out he came to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In doing so, in being fathers of example, in turning the hearts of our children and our hearts toward our children, we create, we have a people that are prepared for the Lord. You know, society does have it a little bit right. The absence of fathers in the home creates a problem. How to fix that, I think they have it wrong. It's not social programs. Brother Phil, it's a heart problem. There's nothing going to fix that but a genuine relationship with God. And we can throw all, and I'm going to tell you, that's where we're a little bit wrong in this day and in this current hour and this current uh, atmosphere that we're living in. This current people think that we can just throw this after it and that after it. This, we'll put this band-aid here and that band it, It's not going to fix it. Because we're trying to do a social program to fix somebody's problem when we were not intended to fix their problems, but we were intended to turn their hearts towards God. The duty of the church is to turn the hearts of people towards God. Amen? We need more than just a caring mother. We need caring mothers. We need caring mothers. I do not want to negate the fact. That's not what the platform I'm standing on. We need loving mothers that nurture children. Amen? But we need fathers whose hearts are turned toward their children as well. I'm going to back out of my notes here a second and hang with me for a minute. The dilemma of the church, I'm not talking about the church world, I'm talking about the dilemma of the church today, is that it's not taking responsibility. Amen? Much like the physical fathers of this day, it's not taking responsibility. Let me show you what that looks like. The physical fathers of today, it's easy, and, and please follow me, okay? It's easy for me to buy a kayak. It's easy for me to buy an instrument or buy this or buy that. Put something in my kids' hands that occupies their time. A device in their hand that occupies their time so that I can get what I need to get done. Understand me when I say. I'm trying to follow this here, so just hang with me. I'm getting this just like you are. The same thing's happening 
in our church today because we'll put another social program on the agenda. We'll add another smoking lights, and I don't mean that. I do mean that physically, and I also mean that with it as an illustration as well. Another, another program is not going to fix. I'll tell you what's going to fix is when our hearts are turned to the Father. When we're fully fixed on Him. And to do that, to get people to do that, we've got to be right. Amen? We've got to turn our hearts towards God. I applaud the father who spends quality physical time with their children. It's vital. It's needful. But is that quality time turning their hearts towards God? Or is that turning their hearts towards other things? I mean, I, I, okay, you're going to have to follow me again. I have seen fathers, well-meaning men. Now, you have to understand me when I say this. Men that I love. Men that I, that I put on a pedestal. But when they begin to have problems with their kids, they start putting them in, in programs. At a young age, they start putting them in this and putting them in that. You can, you can put the label on it. You got the label. I don't have the label. You got the label. Put it on it. If the shoe fits, wear it. And we think that that's going to carry them through. But what we don't realize is we've turned their hearts towards that aspect. And we sit back and we wonder. With all of the God-given knowledge we can hold in our head, we wonder. What happened? Because we turned their hearts to something else before we turned it to God. Let me tell you something. If your kid is seeking... Now, you're going to have to hang tight here for a second. If your kid needs to be baptized in Jesus' name, if your kid needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost, that's what you need to focus on. That's what you need to be talking about. You need to be talking about God, 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 God. Hey, everything is about God. Because when you tempt them with something else, when you put another pacifier, when you give them another lollipop, that becomes what they want. And I'm going to tell you something. Again, try to take a lollipop from a kid that you gave them. That you gave them. Somebody say preacher, preacher, pastor. It's impossible to get that taste out of their mouth. I'm, I'm going to step up and be real plain with you. I, I lived in the house where the first two of us, Bubba, you going, uh-uh, uh-uh, what time is it? They ain't home, call them. Go get them. Go get them. There wasn't no call them then. It was go get them. One time I was up and on my own, and I was, had my own vehicle, Brother White. I was, I was me. I was the man. I stayed out till 12. Well, I knew what was going to happen, Brother Daniel. It wasn't going to be good at 12. Didn't matter if it was 6. Nine o'clock the next day, it wasn't going to be good. So I just stayed on out till three. I see you smiling under that mask, Sister Tasha. I just stay out till three. Ain't going to be no worse. He can't kill me beyond kill me. I mean, dead is dead. So I slipped up in the house at three o'clock. Oh, boy, I slid by their bedroom because their bedroom was the first one on the right when you come in the door. And we lived in a trailer. And anybody knows what a trailer sounds like? You don't just. I mean, most of the time it was off because we lived on that Bonaire gumbo. And it was it, it moves all the time. So the door wouldn't quite shut anyway. You had to give it some. Uh. And I said, boy, Brother Keith, I slipped back there. Got to my bedroom. I'm saying, no lightning, no thunder. I made it. Got in my bed, went to sleep. And Bubba, let me tell you, they might be mornings I wouldn't wake up, but on that morning, 6 o'clock, when the alarms were ringing in their room, I was up and ready. I slipped up to the table, got down, sat down, started eating my breakfast, just smiling. I made it. Oh, brother driver that you guys know so well, oh, oh nice brother driver, oh, well-tempered brother driver. Even killed Brother Driver. He took his fork. He didn't look at me. It would have been best if he had. At least I'd know there was eyes in those sockets and not flames. I couldn't see nothing. He looked at his table, at, the ta at this plate. 
And all I could see, Sister Mary, was a broken man. A man whose heart was broken. He didn't yell. He couldn't. He didn't throw anything. He didn't even get mad. He couldn't. But he said, three o'clock, huh? That's all he ever said. I was late one time. One time. You say because you're scared of your dad. No. I know where my dad's connection came from. And I know the man that if he'd have been mad at me, he'd have beat me senseless. I know the man that if it wasn't coming from right here, he'd have yelled at me. But it came from deep down in here. And he was broken. And that day, I realized there was a man that would forever have my back. I don't care what upset he got at me. He cared about me. Now, let me tell you something. If you're planning on having a bunch of kids, this is where it gets hairy. Sister Remillard, Brother Remillard, we'll let y'all stand outside and take names. And I don't know. I, I mean, oh, I'd love to have 20 kids, but, I mean, I got three, and the progression is we're good. They got all the right sass and all the right love. I'm, I'm good right there. One more we don't know. But there was two other boys, and I pray to God they don't. I hope they understand the love if they hear what I'm saying tonight, this morning. But hey, they're doing this at school. Could we? He was wore down dealing with me. My sister was an angel. I'm not lying. She literally has wings, folks. They're just under that dress. She's an angel. I'm not lying. She's an angel. I wore him down. And he said, okay, okay. You young people need to be listening. When, you, you, when a father and a mother gets wore down to the point that they don't know what to do, they throw their hands up, you're in trouble. Well, I, they're going to be doing this down at the river tonight. Can I go? I, don't, I just don't think that's a good idea. You see, they didn't, they ran right past 3 o'clock. One of them, uh, all kinds of trouble. Brother Josh, you, I mean, y'all, some of y'all can relate. And I've seen my dad stand up and said, if this ever happens in my house, and I've seen him take that plate, Brother Perez, and I've seen him sit down, and just as humbly as he spoke to me that morning, I've seen him take that humble pie and eat it. And I'm going to tell you what, if you don't know my dad, that takes a lot of doing for him to eat words that came out of his mouth. But he ate them. If you're not careful as a father today, let me tell you what, teach him to fish, teach him to hunt. Your girls, teach them to do girl stuff. Teach them to cut grass. Teach them whatever. Whatever it is, Dad, don't fail to teach them and don't fail to teach them things that they need to know. But whatever you do, don't fail to, hurt, to turn their hearts towards God. You know, we heard the other night the responsibility of a pastor, and I stand here this morning, and I, I take that, Amen. I wear that. The responsibility of the pastor is to turn the heart of the people to God. But what about the responsibility of each and every one of us to turn the hearts of people to God? At every step of the way, it seems that God has built into life people that would turn our hearts towards Him. And today we talk about the Father's responsibility. In all truthfulness, the office of the mother the office of the Father, have both been so minimalized by our world that is shaping our future for something no less than what the, book, the Word of God has already said today. This world is being shaped and it's being conditioned for something that because the world has put such a label on mothers and fathers today, there is something coming upon this earth that is no less than a curse. But a curse of what? 
Because I feel like to say just that it's a curse, what does that mean? In Psalm 78, 5 through 7 says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. The boundaries were set. The father did his job. The church did their job. Which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them. Even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandment. You know, we've all heard the portion of Scripture that says that there arose a generation that knew not God. What happens when they don't know God? That means that memorials weren't put in place. That means they weren't taken back to the place where the crossing of the river was. They don't know anything about the story from Egypt because you know, it's kind of like I said last night, it's just become a fairy tale anyway. And today, I don't care, and I don't don't want to say this lightly, but you can take the Word of God today and there's an equal book out there anywhere you want to turn that will make this sound like child's play. And we also heard last night, and let me say this in here when we're all here, that we sometimes scoff because a pastor or a well-meaning individual stands in his pulpit and proclaims that there is deliverance, there is being set free from a literal burning hell. We, we scoff at that. We say, wait, wait, what are we doing? Don't sing songs about the blood, Sister Mary. That's a, that's a gory issue. But you'll let them go out and get on a, on a game that's far worse. That does this, that does this, it desensitizes them. Let me tell you what, the devil can throw a hologram up that looks just like what God's doing. We heard that just a few days ago. Brother Rimmelard and I talked about it in the hallway. If How did the devils do what they did with their staff if Moses did what he did because it was the power of God? I'll tell you how they did it. They submitted themselves to the powers of hell. Amen? I, I, I've told the story, but I won't just rush past it, of how me and my brothers, we had shared a room. And in that room, there was an alarm clock, and there was a hat that was over the alarm clock one night. And I told him, I said, hey, before you get on the top bunk, you mind moving? It was my hat. It was my rocking R hat for the Warner Robins High School that I bought. It was a fitted baseball cap. I loved it. And he said, nope, and he climbed on up in the top bunk. And I said, well, I had played with this stuff in my mind a little bit. And I thought, I can do this. I can do this. I'm going to move that hat without getting up. I wasn't going to get up. I was going to lay right there in the bed and move that hat. And you may laugh. Go ahead. Have your fun. But I was serious. And I would say no more than probably three or four minutes went by. I mean, that long I was dedicated to the task, Sister Mary. That hat was going to move. And I wasn't calling on Jesus. I wasn't calling on Satan either. But there is not but two. You will either serve. Come on. And here I was playing around his campfire. And suddenly, thank God, from the top bunk there came this loud scream mama and you know what happens when you scream mama mama and daddy's coming you scream daddy daddy's coming but you scream mama mama and daddy's coming because he's going to prevent what it is fixing to happen because he's planning on having a good night sleep well and you fixing to mess it up because she's going to be mad she comes running back there and got to take care of you and here they come. I, I'm, I, now I'm jarred out of my whatever's going on. And he said, call the police. Call the police. I don't know what they was going to do. You better call Ghostbusters, I reckon. But he began to sit there and just shaking all over. Again. It took them a while to get him calmed down. And he said, it grabbed me. It had me held down. He had no idea. You can't say, well, I told him I was going to be playing, trying to move it. I didn't say nothing to him. I just was down there doing it. He said something came through the roof, held him down to the bed. 
But when he got loose, let me tell you something that happened right here. I didn't play with moving nothing. No more ever again in my life. You got to be careful what you play with. And if your heart is not turned, Daddy, if your heart is not turned to your children and your children's heart to you and they start playing with things, who's there to save them? Who's there to warn them? Wow, this is Father's Day. Y'all ready for me to dismiss? It just keeps getting deeper. If I take this young man as his father or his dad, this man, this young man right here, there ain't nobody sitting here, and I bring something home, and I watch it, or I participate in it, or I go somewhere and I participate in it, That young man, I'm his daddy. He, he admired, he, that's my dad. From a young age, that's my dad. And he loves dad. And I don't care if you speak in tongues every day. I don't care if you read your Bible every day. That young man don't. And you might be able to do something and get by with it. But that young man don't. That young lady don't. Well, we watch that in our spare time. We watch that in the bedroom. We do this. We go there. We go there. We don't do that at home. We go somewhere and do this. Let me tell you what you're doing because this is not such a physical world as you think it is. It's more of a spiritual world we are inhabiting and we are inhabited by. And when I bring stuff into their purview, into their arena, I'm responsible for how it affects them. And you say, well, I, I, I know I'm struggling with something, but I, I don't, I, I, I keep it hidden. I keep it hidden. It's not just affecting you. To say that we as fathers are perfect is a far cry from the truth. I know that we're not. But will we abandon our posts because things get difficult? Because things get heavy? Because things get burdensome? Well, if we do, and listen to me very, very carefully. If we do, we're just as responsible for the life, the eternity of that child as the mother who takes the decision away from her child and says that she's going to make the decision for that child. And takes that child's life. You can talk all you want to about women's rights. But Bubba let me tell you something. Brother you got an equal responsibility. And if that child doesn't make it to heaven. Because we didn't do our part to turn their hearts towards God. Their hearts towards us. We're living for God. It's, isn't it odd in here that it doesn't say. It says the heart of the children to the father. And the heart of the father to the children. Amen? Don't abort the spiritual baby by snatching them from the spiritual womb before they can even have a chance to be born spiritually. We've got to turn our hearts back to the oracles of God. This was something that came up in my, in my study. We've got to turn their hearts back. Let me tell you something. Men and young men alike, you need to decide today, will you allow your heart to be turned towards God so that you can turn the hearts of others, your children towards you and your heart towards them? Let me tell you what. What, what is it? If, if, if men don't turn their hearts toward their children, what does that take? That takes me turning my heart from some, away from some things. Some of the things that has my attention needs to go away. Come on. Am I in the Bible still? I think I am. I'm trying to help men understand today that if your attention is on other things besides God, that's where your kid's attention is going to be turned. Beware the father that turns the heart of his children away from God. Beware the father that negates the necessity of living for God. Beware the father that presents his children with alternative lifestyles. Beware the father that allows his children to lead the home. And this is the easy one. 
The next one might not be so easy. But beware the father that turns the heart of the children in the home towards things that they shouldn't be turning their hearts towards. I'm still, still going to try to preach to you this morning. Beware the father that puts his wife in a position that she is to be the physical and the spiritual bearer of the children. Do I need to say that again? I said beware the father who puts his wife in the position that she has to be both the physical and the spiritual bearer of the children. It's a load they weren't intended to carry. Just as you were not intended or created to carry that burden. It is my right and it is my responsibility to turn the hearts of my children towards God. Acts 7, 38 and 39 says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him at the Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles given to us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. Same, we're still in the same vein of the same conversation. He would not accept what God had given to them, the oracles of God given to them, but they turned their hearts back towards Egypt. Where is, the, where is Egypt? The world. Amen? The world. Can we say it? The world. The world. The world. This, this upsets me bad right here. I'm telling you now. I'm going to try to be nice, but, but I'm going to tell you it upsets me bad when you can't get your children to church, but you can get them to something else. Amen? Am I talking to fathers here today? Or you can offer them another another option since they don't they don't do this or they don't do that or this ain't there or that ain't there. I tell you where they need to be and that's in the house of God. Go ahead and listen to another one of Brother Matt Tuttle's ser- sermon. Go ahead. I, I suggest you just download the whole mix, Sister Mary, because I'm going to tell you it talks about him being raised and there wasn't a youth group. Are you going to live for God if there's not? Let me tell you why he lived for God. Because there was a father that stepped out in front of him and championed the call. And the world's putting that video on display, by the way. Oh, yeah, they got that on display right now. The world's putting that image on display because they know that that it takes a dad to stand up and say, no, this will not come in my home. You're not going to do that in my child. He didn't have a Christian school. He went to public school, and and his father stood up and said, that will not take place in that. Turning the hearts... Of our children. First Peter 2, 5 through 6 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Daddy, don't throw your hands up in the air. And act like you don't know what's going on. Get your heart back. Get right back to the cornerstone. Get back to the foundation. One word that is in these passages that are tied together that I came across that stood out to me, and that is the word lively. As I study the passage we just read in Acts, it related to those lively oracles that were on the breastplate of the priesthood. It, it reminded us of the stones and that these stones had a peculiar, a particular meaning to them. These were not just stones of beauty that had no other. They were not for ornamentation, if you will. There was specific intent with them. Their arrangement, their type, their color, everything mattered to God as to how they were set in relation to one. These lively oracles are also found to share some semblance to the fact that the word of God is related as to being written upon our heart. Lively oracles. These are things that as we are in his, he, he, the temple is now in us. We are the priesthood. And we wear those same oracles across our chest. And they mean the same thing. They hold the same value. Amen? There's not one thing that God did since creation that doesn't have an impact upon us today as we stand here or sit here. 
And 2 Corinthians 3 and 2 and 3 says, ye are, your, ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Fleshly tables. The heart of a father that is after God, set upon God, filled after God, is an invaluable commodity. When the heart of the father turns towards God, the heart of the children turns towards the father. The father's example leads the children on the straight path after God. After God. And my cry is that our hearts would be turned towards God. I wonder if there's a father here today with me that would like to turn your heart towards God. No, I'm talking about take off this. Take this off. It don't mean nothing. And, and we should. We should look our best when we come to church. Let me tell you something. If God was to dress us all down this morning to look what we, like we, we ought to look like, it might be like the presentation that was up here on the, on the board in Sunday school. You understand what I'm saying? If we was to look like what we really represent, would we look like a man with a nice tie and a nice shirt and a nice suit? Or would we be derelicts, homeless? You say, man, you sure are rough on the men. I am rough on the men because we bear a responsibility that the lady does not have to bear. She wasn't intended to carry. And if the man won't carry, that puts a double responsibility on the mother. And I'm going to tell you, she will break down under the load. Almost assuredly, she will break down under the load. And if you love your wife, I really, really don't want to skip this next part, and it's, it's long, it's lengthy, and you know I can read fast, and I hope you can hold on. Ephesians 2, and I say, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. <clears throat> Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we had our conversation in times past. I'm talking about us. We had our conversations in wrong places. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in ages to come you might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, you were untouchable, but now you have become touchable. You have you were you were cast away, but now you have been brought nigh. You you could not come to me, but now you can come to me. I have made a way. You were without hope and without God. Kenzie, Chloe, and Courtney. You might think your dad looks good. <laughs> and I know y'all do. I chip off the old block. Some beautiful girls. They look like their dad. But I was without hope. I did not have a way to get to God. But he made a way for me. I was, you can read it in the Bible. It declares who I was. I was a liar. I was a cheat. If you read it all the way down in some shape or form, whether physically or spiritually, I fit the bill. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off, you are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, not your dad, not your mom. But God has become our peace. 
who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. For through him we have both we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. I'm trying to skip along a little bit. But it's because of him that we are builded together for a habitation to God through his spirit. If I could just preach to my babies today, I would want them to know that I can't save them. We go, you can ask them, we go to parking lots and we get out. And boy, I'm like, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm like, where's everybody at? Get, one goes one way, one goes the other. And I'm like, hey, get over here. What are you doing? Get over, get over. And I'm, I'm hopeless. I, I try, I try, I try. To not ever let them get in a situation where they would be compromised. Physically. I stand out in the middle until they get across because I don't want them to get hit by a car. I figure I can, they'll see me. And oh, the effort I put in to being a physical dad. The incessant thoughts that go through my mind, the dreams day and night that I've had, that I've thought about, what if this happens to them? What if that happens to them? Things that maybe they might not ever even know of in their life, but that I worry all the time. My wife will tell you, I'm a worrier. I worry, I worry, I worry about you. I sometimes sit in different places, home, in the office, and I think of some of you, and I think about the decisions that you're making even for if it's for a couple of weeks or whatever, I worry that there's things that's going on in your life that might turn your heart away from God. And as much physical effort as I put into being a, a physical father, protecting them from the physical ailments, I've, I've gone to great lengths. I spent good money. But if I offer them a counterfeit. I offer them an entertainment of this world. I offer them the satisfaction of this world. And they lose their soul. Have I done what I was called to do as a father? I don't believe I have to answer that question. I believe that every one of us know what the answer. I cannot give you a way of escape. And the, the, the scripture does not tell us to go out and buy all the guns and the ammo and the this, the that, the other, do this, that, the other, so that you could save them physically. It says turn their hearts towards you. Let me tell you what happens when you have the heart of a child turned towards a father and the heart of the father to the child. They're in sync. They're going to go through everything together. Amen. I watched this morning as Sister Tashi come around the corner and, and walked up behind Brother Prez. I watched until he saw her standing there. You say, why is that? Because I know him from a long time ago. I know that man. I know he loves that girl. I know there's not one thing. I know that if today you was to point ten girl guns at her and tell her one of them bullets is going to get her, he'd take nine of them. He'd take all ten if he could. There's nothing that he wouldn't spare. But I want to ask you, Brother Perez, and I know the answer to this, and that's why I'm using him this morning. That knee, when it touches the floor, it calls out the name of his children. When, when words are said towards heaven, they're said on behalf of his children. And there was a time. There was a time that it didn't look good, did it? But did you quit praying? Did you quit believing? We cannot save or produce anything of our own physical nature that would, but God, but God, who is rich in his mercy, by which he loved us, he became, 
a propitiation for our sins. And these were writings and ordinances that were against us aforetime. But he came and he took the writings and the ordinances that were against us and he put them away. He became the sacrifice for sin. Colossians 2 and 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And as they come to the music, you can stand with me if you'd like this morning. For the dilemmas of life, dads, listen. For the dilemmas of life, for the heartbreaks of life, for the rejection of life, for the sin that you might find yourself in, father and child alike, this is where we have to walk in solidarity. This is where we have to stand together. Father and children alike, we have to turn our hearts together. Now that we've got our hearts set on each other, Father, I may, as a father, I make a commitment to my daughters. As my daughters, they make a commitment to me. We're going to live for God. We're going to live for God. It's something you got to talk about in your house. you got to talk about it when you get up and when you sit down and when you go out and when you come in, when you walk outside, when you lay down. It's something you got to talk about. You say, Brother James, you sound a little, almost a little frantic this morning. You're kind of beating this one the, like a dead horse. Let me tell you something, guys. I've seen, I've seen the hopelessness of parents. And I know that, that they are their children's only hope. And when you get down to nothing, and when you get down to where there's nothing left to do, it's time for you to lift up God and to make Him the center of that home. Him the center of what you're doing. And when you can't do it, and you know we can't, it's time for us to say, I give you Jesus. He can when I can't. Amen. Lord Jesus, I love you today. I thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. On this Father's Day, I just ask that you would touch the hearts and minds of every father in this place. That your Holy Ghost power, God, would touch our hearts and our minds as we turn our hearts back towards you. As we seek to do your will, as we seek to influence those that you have given us today. Lord, let there not be a careless moment. Let there not be a careless thought. An idle word, an idle deed that would turn their hearts away from you. I pray that you'll touch the hearts and lives of men in this room and the hearts and lives of children in this room today. That our hearts would be set fully upon you in Jesus' name. These altars are open and I pray that you would come as a family this morning. We would gather together and we would just pray for one another. If you don't have a family or you don't have one to say, pray with or for, I pray that you just put your hand on somebody and just ask God to touch them. Ask for a father to receive strength from the presence of God this morning. Amen. I know that I myself am weak. In some areas, I need God to be that spiritual force in my life that pulls things back together. Lord, I pray that you would help us today. I pray that you would convict our hearts. I pray that you would help us to change our minds, to change the outlook that we have right now to turn our eyes fully upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. I love you Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart Lord. Yes Lord open. Open the eyes of my heart. Open my eyes. I've got to see you Lord. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Open my eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Open my eyes. I want to see you. I want to see you. 